All right, so I feel like I'm being inducted in a cult with these spotlights here. It's just, uh, all right, uh, anybody could turn those lights down just a little bit so I don't have to squint the whole time? Uh, anyway, yeah, I'm Kevin Lewis, uh, professor of theology and law at uh, Talbot School of Theology, Bio University, and the Master of Arts Christian Apologetics Program and the Master of Arts Science and Religion Program. I was supposed to bring some recruiting materials, but I forgot them at home. Uh, by the way, I've, I, I've been sick all week, and uh, so I'm, I'm about 80% recovered. So if you hear little noises coming out of me, nobody needs to rebuke me for anything or something to come out of me. So uh, just, just on all my appropriate controlled substances to uh, uh, keep me going for the day. So anyway... Uh, yeah, Dale asked me to do a miracle, and that was to, uh, here today, and that was to condense 30 years of ministry into a 50-minute lecture, uh, which, yeah, I'll, I'll try and do that, but I didn't think you guys were the miracle church here, right? At least that's not what you advertised. So, yeah, my, my emphasis, I'll, I'll tell you this uh, to, get, to get some context here. Um, my emphasis has always been, bottom line, Bible and theology, so that's my first task as a professor and a pastor, uh, is uh, teach teach the scriptures, teach good systematic theology. And then after that, uh, I'll just tell you what you should always note and what's lacking from the modern church is what we find, uh, the command in Titus 1.9, that the pastors, the leaders of the church are supposed to be able to both exhort and sound doctrine and refute those who contradict, okay? And that means what? Oh my gosh, they have to say something negative every once in a while refute those who contradict. Okay, let me say something negative. Satan is evil, okay? Demons are bad. You can write that down if you're going to forget, okay? Yeah, so, so the fact is you, we need clarity on these things. But uh, So again, so, after, so I, I study in the area of, quote, heresies or false doctrine. I, I teach courses, what's called Cults of America. So we look at American religious cults, general apologetics. I teach a class called Demonology in the Occult. And uh, so we look at, so again, lots of stuff. And then I, besides my theology degrees, I have a law degree. Uh, I work on religious liberty issues. That's my main issue. Uh, so, uh, and also a practicing attorney. So you can see it starts out really well at Bible and theology, and it goes downhill after that. Heresies, heresies, cults, demons, and lawyers on the bottom. So, so it's just, just way down. So, but to, uh, to really um, think about, this topic, I mean, which is really, look at the um, threats to biblical truth, modern day threats. I mean, well, that's about, you know, about 40 hours in a class to all the modern day threats. So what I'm going to be able to do is give you some highlights. But most of you have heard that it, it really is true that, look, you want, <laughs> if, if you want to be able to spot a counterfeit bill, study real money. If you want to be able to spot bad theology, study lots of good theology. And anything that doesn't fit, you're going to say there's something wrong with that. And if you know your Bible and you know your theology, guess what? You'll be able to spot anything that comes along. So trying to give you grocery lists to memorize is not the best thing. But at some point, you need to be familiarized with the false ideas out there. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, start with today. And I'll tell you the... Uh, and what I'm going to start with is, you know, we talk about what are the false gospels out there. Well, to really think about it, I mean, well, what's the true gospel? You want to be able to spot the false ideas and the false gospels hurting the church. Uh, I, I start most of my days reading, uh, reading the Bible, but particularly I, I regularly read the end of the book of Revelation. And the reason is because... I keep asking myself, because I see colleagues who don't really, I don't think, believe this stuff. I see pastors who don't believe this stuff. And I'll just say, Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, it says, And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged from the things which are written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. 
If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So my question, not only for you, but for all my seminary students and others, is do you really believe this? Now, the fact that you're at a conference like this is the fact is you do believe it. It's the other people you have to worry about, right, who are attending church. Because I'll tell you, why do we do this? Why do we feel a sense of urgency? Because people are dying in their sins, and they're going to spend an eternity in misery and shame and pain and dishonor apart from God. That's why. And true love not only motivated God to send Christ to the cross, but should motivate us to go out and take people's anger, take people's hatred for confronting them in their sins, confronting them with their false ideas. And yet we don't care if they hate us. They hate the one who came before us. But I'll tell you, you stay with people. You love them enough to tell them the truth. And when they finally believe, guess what? They're going to be so, they, you know, they're thankful because you didn't give up on them. So this is why part of our job is to say, you know what, it's not our job to make friends. Woe, woe, as Jesus said, woe unto you if all men speak well of you. Believe me, I will never have that problem, okay? So, So I start with, look, there's the end. God really is holy. God is immutably holy. God can never look at sin and be pleased with it. God must separate from sin. And this is the result of all the unrepentant sin, eternity in the lake of fire. And that's why how I, one of the ways I keep a sense of urgency about this. Because I'll tell you, I see plenty of folks who do no evangelism whatsoever. And I say, you know what, if, if you do not evangelize even your own family members, do you really believe this? If any of you saw someone walking off a cliff, you know, some blind person, you'd immediately walk over or run over and try and prevent them from walking to their deaths. But how many people, but see, because you believe that, if people fall off, you know, the law, you believe in the law of gravity, right? You know, people walk off cliffs, bad things happen. Do we really believe this, that God is holy, that there is retributive justice, so again, that's why the first thing to really think about, and sadly, the question is, where are the, where are the Christian leaders on this? So, so keep that in mind. So next step, what is the gospel? I'll tell you um, two big theological terms, okay? The good news is first, penal substitution, okay? In other words, somebody else took my punishment that I deserve, okay? That's the good news. I deserve, because of my sin, to be in hell. All of us right now, because of our sin, deserve to be in hell apart from God. But yet God was gracious and made a way for us. Why? Because he and he alone, the offended party in our sin transaction, decided to bear the harm that we caused to the relationship with him and not hold it against us anymore. And then it's applied to us, Christ's atonement, his penal substitution, if we simply trust his offer of reconciliation and forgiveness. That's the gospel, period, end of story. And so when you think about that, the, God, the good news is simple. Penal substitution, and even though you're not righteous, God has given to you a righteousness that's not your own, it's his. Imputed alien righteousness. Alien meaning foreign, doesn't mean Klingons, okay? So, so that's the... Uh, yeah, because, well, you can figure it out, you're Star Wars or Star Trek fans. So, so anyway, the point is, is that this is how we can walk with God. He's forgiving, he's loving, he's, loving, he's mentoring, he's all these things. So before I go into the false gospels, a couple more texts. Um, but a text like 1 Corinthians 15, uh, you want to see what the real gospel is? Paul just, you know, makes it quite simple. And it'd be nice if the rest of the church would follow it. So turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15. And what do we see? The Apostle Paul says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, and which you also received, and which you also are, in which you also stand, and by which you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. Get it? Christ died for sins according to the Scripture. What's the wages of sin? 
Only half of you said that, but I get it, okay? So, yeah, wages of sin is death. That we, we deserve a death penalty, spiritual and physical death. Christ took our death penalty. Christ died for sin, according to the Scripture. Okay? He was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the Scripture. Now, when you think about the resurrection of Christ, I'll tell you, I, I hear a lot of non-clarity in, in uh, Resurrection Sunday sermons. Uh, a vast majority of people talk about resurrection power and resurrection life and resurrection this. But what's the resurrection all about? Why is it that Paul says later in this chapter, if Christ is not risen, our faith is empty, we're still in our sins? It, it's, it, here's why, okay? He didn't rise from the dead to, quote, prove he was God, even though he was God incarnate, the second person of the Trinity. Here's what the resurrection is about. Again, right back to what is the wages of sin? death. Well, Jesus didn't sin. He's not obligated to die. So when he dies in our place, this is important, he is taking our punishment. He is taking, what, the wrath of God in our place, in punishment. The point is this, is when he comes back to life and he appears bodily again, what is that? It's a proof that atonement is complete. The penalty has been paid. That's why Paul says, if Christ is not risen, we're still in our sins. Because the atonement has not been completed. That's the gospel. First, it's penal substitution. All the stuff after that, you know, reconciliation, everything else, comes after the penalty being paid. Because, again, I, I spend weeks and weeks and weeks on this stuff, but I'll tell you, the people in the world with the best moral compass are born again Christians. Why? Because we have a new heart. We're born again, we're new creations in Christ, and we have the Holy Spirit. So we are the best sin detectors, right? And we should all start with our sin detecting in our own lives and repent of it. So here's the point. Now, one of my things I did as I put my lawyer hat on is I I clerked for the Court of Appeals for a couple of years and uh, doing crim law cases. And I'll tell you this, I worked on baby murder cases, child rape cases, things like that. And I'll tell you this, none of you here as born-again Christians can ever be indifferent to a baby murder because you're good people. Could God ever be indifferent to a baby murder? Could he look at hugging a baby and murdering a baby the same way? He wouldn't be good. You wouldn't be good if you could be indifferent to that. A righteous, loving, caring person would have to hate that kind of evil. Well, guess what? God has a far more sensitive moral compass than any of us do. And that's why he sees clearly the harm and the evil that's done by every sin. And he's repulsed by it. And yet, because he's just and the justifier, he makes a way for us. So Christ dies for sin, according to the Scripture, buried Raised on the third day, according to the scripture, then he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. So, now, here's the point, is that, look, that's the gospel. When Paul says, here's the gospel, Christ died for sin, according to the scripture. He's buried, he raised again on the third day, according to the scripture. And, of course, he says, you know, this is what was delivered to me. And this was predicted from all eternity. Acts 2.23, right? Peter's Pentecost sermon, by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men. Fact is, Christ's death, God knew we were, that, that the human race was going to sin, and at the same time, in eternity past, God made a way. He ordained the death of Christ to make, uh, in other words, to, to make a satisfaction, to, to make an atonement that's sufficient to save anybody who will believe. That's it. So he saves us on that basis. So I could go more and more on what the true gospel is, but to start talking about false gospels and threats affecting the church, um, I I can give you a number of them. I'll I'll tell you the, the probably... The biggest threats have been the most common threats from the beginning of uh, the fall of the human race. And I'll tell you, what, what was the first heresy, right? The first heresy was Eve believing what Satan said. God says, don't eat of, of the tree. or you, The day you eat of the fruit, you shall surely die. And 
What's the response? Of course, Satan comes and says, wait a minute. No, 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 no. You're not going to die. The day you eat of the fruit, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. See, so what's the first false gospel? You can be your own God. See, we all have this sense that God exists, there's a creator God, there's a natural moral law, and, but what happens, you know, Romans 1 tells us, people what? Suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Why? Because I have to admit that I've done wrong. I have to be subordinate to someone. The, the most common and greatest error is for everybody to want to be their own God. Now, people don't call it that. They don't say, I'm, I'm a God. Now, people don't look in the mirror and start singing how great thou art to themselves, right? Okay. But that has been, unfortunately, you look at all, again, I have an undergrad degree in world religions, comparative religions, and philosophy. And um, the, uh, I, I'll save you the time on the degree, right? I mean, the bottom line is, is that the, the devil and the false prophets make as many different ways for people to stay away from God as possible. Uh, you want a new way? We'll give you a new way. But the first way is, is that, no, 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 God lied to you. Oh, that sense that you have of dread and the afterlife and that, that need for submission to the true and the living God, that's false. The day you eat of the fruit, your eyes will be open. In other words, God has kept knowledge from you that you need to know. God's a bad God. He's keeping knowledge from you. So you have to find the secret knowledge. Well, what, what do we call that? The occult. The Latin word means hidden. You seek the secret knowledge and the secret practices. They're going to empower you to do what? To be like God. You, because why? Well, because the fall is real. We're going to die. We're afraid. We're sick. There are lots of effects of the fall that everybody rightly wants to reverse. But the problem is, is that people try and do it without God. And the first step is you try to be your own God and get all the power for yourself. So, <clears throat> so the things that are attractive to people, and I, and I say this, I just finished a course, on, teaching my course on demonology and the occult, and I'll tell you this, is that you, you look at the rise of Islam, you look at the rise of neo-paganism, you look at the rise of these pe people leaving the church to go to, quote, other forms of spirituality, okay? Um, why is that? It's because our leaders failed to preach the true gospel. That's why. Because you look historically at the church, and I'm going to talk about this more in the second hour, the, the history of the church, much less God's people, is a history of starting out well, preaching the gospel, and then the leaders give up preaching the gospel because they want to be approved by the world. And then little by little, the church becomes ineffective. The people that attend the church are, 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 are not born again. They're not discipled. So what happens? People leave and say, you know what? Christianity didn't work for me. Christianity is now discredited as a religion. So now I have to go seek something else to fill its place. So this is what happens. For example, I mean, why do you have Islam, right? You know, the second largest religion in the world. Because you had heresies and liberalism in Middle Eastern Christianity. People weren't getting saved. Uh, the, the paganism of, of the Middle East was coming back, you know, Aladdin, genies, flying carpets. What had been suppressed when, when Christianity was strong now was coming back in its polytheistic, magical, occult form. And all of a sudden, in the midst of this liberalism, Muhammad comes along and says, oh, the scriptures were corrupt. I'm restoring the true monotheistic faith. Okay? That's how Islam got started, because of a weak, heretical church. That's how it starts. So this is why one of the best things you can do to stop people from going into other religions is preach true religion. That's what we need to do. So the first false gospel is always, and it's always going to be what? I mean, it's always that you're your own God. So when you think that you are self-sufficient, then that's when you're going to perish. I'll just, uh, for the sake of time, read Isaiah chapter 47. The Babylonians turned all their occultists, their astrologers, their witches, their mediums, to everyone else. And in the end, what happens? Destruction. God says in the end, there's none to save you. 
you trusted in your magic, you trusted in all these things. Now, I say that because you go to the church, be amazed how many people think it's okay to be a Christian and then go play with a Ouija board. Or why? Because I want to get secret knowledge of something. Or they, you know, a dabble in witchcraft. Uh, I get calls all the time on these kinds of things. So while that is probably not, not the most prevalent, let's move to a couple other of some of these supposed more mainstream ideas of, of false gospels. Uh, I'll tell you, the, probably the, so again, you got to know the true gospel first to even think about this. So what's another, quote, false gospel or threat to the church? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, it's moralism, okay? The gospel of moralism, that somehow trying to be a good person is going to save you. I'll tell you, that, that's probably, if, if you talk to people who think they're okay, people who haven't really understood their sin, understood the justice of God. I mean, I'm probably not this church, but you know, because but, but go, go talk to other people. So why you ask people why they're going to go to heaven? Because I, I try to be a good person. They say, really, have you ever sinned? Well, maybe once. Stop lying. Okay, right? Uh, have you, think about this, okay? Because again, I, I can't do a whole series on the doctrine of the atonement right now, but this is the error of all the world religions, okay? You ready? It's that same idea that you can do enough good works to make up for your bad works. That Literally, it's it, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, you name it, all of them, the cults of Christianity, right? It's, it's not grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, to the glory of God alone, grounded in the Bible alone, right? It somehow <clears throat> works, or a little bit of faith plus a lot of works, and that's going to earn your way to heaven. That is the absolute ridiculous understanding of what justice is about. God is a God of righteousness and justice. And I'll tell you, God is unjust if he doesn't give us what we deserve. And the wages of sin is death. So sin must be punished. But again, so what does Christ do? As the offended party and the judge, he takes the penalty. Justice is served. Now, think about this as you move along. Um, try this sometime. Okay, you ready? Um, let's say that you are, because um, uh, again, the, the point is as to what? To ma- you want to maintain a relationship with another person. By the way, salvation in Christianity isn't becoming God. It's not escaping God's cosmic jail, you know, merely. Salvation ultimately is what? It's forgiveness and reconciliation of a broken relationship. The problem is all the false gospels have a false salvation. The real gospel means I know God. God has forgiven me. God has reconciled with me. God lives in me. God is my father. I am a child of God. That's the real result of the gospel. So so think about this. Since the goal is forgiveness and reconciliation, so here's the problem. If you have a good relationship with someone then how, how do you lose it, right? I mean, it's easy. Okay, I, I go and I offend my wife. Let's say I've been the perfect husband for 33 years, and I go home after the conference. I walk in, look at her, and say, you're the stupidest, most ugly woman I've ever seen. Slap her and go in my study. Do I have any more eHarmony.com, 29 dimensions of compatibility after that? No, just say no, yeah. How many sins did it take to break... That, that kind koinonia, that peace with my wife. One. And I remain in that unrepentant state, treat her in a dishonorable way, in a sinful way that's harmed her. It only took one. So here's the point. When you think about the, 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 the ridiculousness of doing enough good works to make up for my bad works, see, so now uh, I, I run downtown to the homeless camp, pass out sandwiches, go, go mow my neighbor's lawn who's disabled, and then I come home and slap her again and say, see, I, see all those good works I did? Now you've got to take me back and treat me nice. You're supposed to laugh at that point. So, no, that's not how it works, see? But yet, think about this. All the world religions, all the cults are doing what? Do enough good works to make up for your bad works. All right, now, now a legal analogy, and hopefully you'll go, no, 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 no. Okay. All right, let's say you really wanted to get to the conference on time. So uh, you 
ran a red light, and the fine local law enforcement here pulls you over, gives you a ticket, and then you go to the judge on judgment day, and the judge says, how do you plead? And you're like, well, not guilty. And why? Didn't you run the red light? And you say, well, oh, yeah, I did. And why are you not guilty, Your Honor? You, I really have to, do I really have to explain these things to you? Right before I went through that one red light, I went through 100 green lights and 100 green lights afterwards. So that, that's why I don't have to pay the fine. Don't you understand these things? And that's when the judge says, would you like to enter an insanity plea instead? Okay, that's the, uh, that's the way it works. But, but you can see the, the, the absolute fallacy and, and, and ridiculousness of trying to do good works to make up for your bad works. The only thing that can get, recon- get reconciliation is that the offended party wants to bear the harm and not hold it against you, and you repent of your evil, of your sin, and want a righteous relationship with the person again and know of a, a, an offer of reconciliation. That's it. See, that's why when you start thinking about all these false gospels, right, Mormonism, I want to become a god just like the god over this planet and the other trillions and billions of gods. Say, what? You know, I, yeah, sorry. But see, what do they have to do? They have to redefine the concept of God. It's no longer an eternal, infinite, self-existent creator. Uh, now it's an exalted man. It's, it's a man who's been good enough and smart enough and doggone it worked hard enough, right? You know, and, and now somehow you got to the next level where you can be a little G God. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I, know, I think it was in the Avengers, the Hulk said, yeah, but that's a puny God, right? Uh, yeah, yeah we, we, we don't want puny gods. We don't want the, the, the false kind. So anyway, the gospel of moralism that you can be good enough Okay, is probably one of the ones that is just the most pernicious. Um, all right, moving on because uh, our limited amount of time here, uh, and I'm just going through the. I made a quick list of things here. I cover these for uh, multiple semesters, but uh, the prosperity gospel. See, what's the good news? See, if you have enough faith in Christ, you can you can confess positively confess health and wealth into existence. Okay. And uh, the, the worst kinds of the of the form of that with the Benny Hens, the Kenneth Copelands, the, the folks like that, literally Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagan and others, uh, are literally that, look, God's a man, he's six foot two, he lives on his own planet, that uh, we're, Adam was created as an exact duplicate of God, as one of his literal offspring, uh, that, but unfortunately Adam had God powers, he could speak things into existence out of nothing, uh, the same way God did, and of course the problem is Adam fell, when he did he changed natures, uh, the change of nature is what? He went from being a divine being to a satanic being, according to these word of faith prosperity teachers, that's part. And then the problem now is the whole human race are satanic beings. So now uh, Satan stole the whole, the whole world from God, and now God's kind of biting his nails up on his planet trying to get it back. Uh, and then all of a sudden, now uh, God cut a deal with Abraham, said, hey, Abe, I'm going to make you rich if you let my Christ into the world through your line. Really? Make me rich? Okay. So according to that, so you go through, and now Christ comes to earth, and he's finally, he sneaks in under the Abrahamic covenant. He's the God-man. And then Satan makes a fatal mistake, okay? And by the way, there's uh, a lot of false views of the doctrine of the atonement. One view is called the ransom to Satan view, uh, that somehow Christ was offered to Satan so that Satan would release his captives, okay? Uh, fact is, is, and I hate to ruin this for you, but that's the false theory of the atonement that's in C.S. Lewis' book, The, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Chronicles of Narnia. And I don't know if he actually believed that or not, but that's the theory that's presented in Chronicles of Narnia, where Aslan presents himself to the witch, so the witch will release her, her, his captive. And then what happens? But Aslan comes back. Why? Because he knows the deeper magic before the dawn of time, right? Not really. Just don't, don't, cross, don't write that one down, okay? So... Yeah. So anyway, the, the atonement theory and the prosperity gospel is the ransom to Satan theory on drugs, okay? It's called the born-again Jesus doctrine, or the born-again Jesus theory. And that is that when Satan saw Jesus as a God-man, he got so excited that he dragged, he killed Jesus on the cross, 
okay? And according to this, I think this qualifies for the heresy of the millennium. According to Copeland and Hagen and the others, uh, that Jesus on the cross lost his divine nature, took on a satanic nature, spent three days in hell proper suffering, and then the middle of hell on the third day while suffering under demons and Satan was born again in the middle of hell. That born again means getting your divine nature back, so he swapped his satanic nature back for a divine nature and said you can't keep a God-man down. He rose again from the dead. Uh, And now any one of you who have faith in Christ, right, now you're identified with Christ in union with Christ, and you lose your satanic nature. You, You get a divine nature. You're now a little God, and you can positively confess into existence out of nothing your own health and wealth, Okay. Say, ew, yeah, ew, that, that's the health and wealth gospel, okay? Again, there are different levels of that. that that's the worst case scenario that a vast majority of them believe. Uh, the lower level of that, you'll find <coughs> good, I mean, thoughtful Pentecostals and Charismatics that think health and wealth is guaranteed in Christ's atonement if they have enough faith. Here's the problem with that. See, you can say all the right things. You can say, I believe in the inerrancy of the Bible, the Trinity, the deity of Christ, his atonement, death, burial, resurrection, faith alone in Christ for salvation. But here's the problem. Even though you don't believe in the little gods, the born-again Jesus, and all the other stuff, here's the problem. Now Jesus is just a means to an end. I go to Jesus to get my health and wealth. So what do you have now? An idol. You have a false god. So this is why this, these things can be so subtle. Uh, all right, so that's the prosperity gospel in a nutshell, but I'll tell you, there's a lot of desperation that people have being in poverty. And unfortunately, there, I, there are some people in this movement that actually believe this stuff, and there are a lot of shysters. Because they say, oh, send in your seed faith, in other words, send in your money to my ministry, and then based on the seed faith doctrine, it's going to multiply 30, 60, 100-fold, right? No, it's not really, but okay. So <clears throat> here's the problem. If they really believe that, why don't they take all the money coming in and invest it in other ministries, and then they would get it back 30, 60, 100-fold? So that shows you what? They don't really believe this stuff. Otherwise, they do it themselves as the leaders. So that's the prosperity gospel, but I'll tell you, Um, Other minor ones, here's the opposite one, the poverty gospel. Somehow I'm righteous if I live in poverty and deprive myself. No, God God created us in his image to love, to enjoy, uh, to enjoy the benefits of the earth that he made. Uh, There is no, again, there's no virtue in being impoverished just to be impoverished. It's one thing to say, I'm going to go on the mission field and live in, in less than, you know, modern America standards for the sake of preaching the gospel. But when you're saying that somehow I, my own righteousness is based on my, my, my vow and my desire to somehow live a life of poverty, that, again, that's just a false gospel. Okay? So, so again, it's okay to have money. By the way, you think about people in the Bible, Abraham was probably one of the richest people of his day. Job was probably one of the richest people of his day. Money per se does not in any way you know, make you somehow unholy. The uh, fact is, you know, there's a lot of good Christian people with money, and they say, yeah, they keep shoveling it out for God's purposes, and God keeps giving them more in the back door. And they say, but see, I, but I, the thing is, God has a bigger shovel than I have, right? You know, but what the thing is, is they don't love money over God. That's the key. You love God ultimately for God. All right. Um, next, signs and wonders gospel, okay? Uh, this is one where, again, it's um, all of these have a, have a little kernel like, like, like the prosperity. There's nothing wrong with, with wanting to be, have enough money to live on to help people and to be healthy, okay? The problem is, is when it becomes your God and it controls everything and you use false means to try and achieve it. Signs and wonders, now, this is a, uh, a view that's been around for a few decades now, but the idea is this, is that the gospel, instead of what Paul says, okay, ultimately, and by the way, did God defeat Satan, okay, by, by Christ dying on the cross and rising again from the dead? Yes. 
Satan is doomed. Satan is, 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 is the god of this world, but when you think of him as the god of this world, right, that's like the sheriff of Nottingham, right, ruling, right? He's not supposed to rule that way. Or it's more, more like this. Think of a, a mafia boss in a local community. He might rule the community, but he doesn't have legitimate authority, okay? That, that's, the, that's the quote, the god of this world, and he's been defeated. And that, his, remember, his greatest power is to be a cunning liar, John 8 says he's a liar and the father of lies. He convinced Eve, and again, it's just text after text. For, you know, um, 1 Timothy 4, why, you know, in, in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the doctrines of demons. Yeah, there are human false prophets, and guess what? There's, there's demonic false prophets too. And again, they'll create in, any false gospel. But the problem comes in all these where, yes, um, the gospel, remember, is Christ died for sin. It's rem- first and foremost, based, uh, before anything else, it's removing your penalty for sin based on the free grace of God. All you have to do is accept it because God has already done the work. Here's another one of those big theological words, okay? Monergism. Monergism. What does that mean? One person working. That's monergism. There's only one person who worked for your salvation, and that's God, okay? Avoid synergism, right? That's, by the way, that's spelled with a Y, S-Y-N. That means to work together. You don't work together with God for your salvation. Dead people don't cooperate with God for their salvation, and you're dead in your trespasses and sins. So, the point is, we, we know what the gospel is. The signs and wonders gospel is this, ultimately, it, it's about the true gospel is not preached unless you see manifestations of these visible supernatural signs and wonders. Because primarily what we see is you see an overemphasis on the demonic and the satanic controlling the world. And when Christ comes, it's true that Christ comes in power as well as truth. So, but in this gospel, what you see is, well, there's no true preaching of the gospel and let, because when there's a true preaching of the gospel, the kingdom of God and its power is confronting the power and the kingdom of the evil one. And in that, what you're going to see is, quote, the clash. And then all of a sudden you see people, you know, people drooling and spinning out of control and laughing and uh, playing disco music. I mean, hor- horrible stuff, right? Okay, so... All right, so you, you get the idea. So, so the point is this, is that yes, the, the fact is God has always been omnipotent. God has always been omnipresent. And by the way, when you talk about these, quote, clash of powers, uh, the fact is an omnipotent God is basically going to play, I don't know, you know, a little football stuff, kind of flick the demons into the, you know, the lake of fire. It's not much of a fight, Okay. You know, I mean, uh, Chuck Norris versus Pee Wee Herman, I don't know, right? You know, we'll, uh, yeah, but, but, but the idea that somehow there's this almost, you know, clash of armies or something, no, um, omnipotence doesn't have a problem dispelling a creature uh, and dealing with it. So, uh, but, but also that the statement is somehow that somehow you're, um, the gospel isn't preached unless you see these signs and wonders, well, yes, it is, okay? Uh, bottom line, there's no good reason to believe that we have to see, uh, again, all of these alleged manifestations of laughing, uh, falling over, slain in the spirit, I mean, you name it, uh, uh, because well, somehow God's not present. Well, God doesn't have to manifest his presence. All of you know being born again, is God present in you? Yes. Yeah, God has manifested a presence in you from the time you were born again. You're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the fact is, is that you don't have these overt signs and wonders. Now, can God do that? Sure. He can do it anytime he wants. You know, God, God as a divine being can decide anytime he wants to do a miracle or make some overt manifestation. The problem is, is when you make this a false expectation. And then what happens? Oh, man, you see, these churches are just preaching the Bible and good doctrine. They're boring, right? You know, uh, they're just telling me the truth and making me a good disciple. You know, I, I want to see the show, man. Let me tell you, Disney does a better show than any of these churches, right? You know, uh, go, to, go to a stage magician. They can do it a lot better. Uh, so it's so all that to say, all right, a um, couple other ones here because there's, there's lots of other stuff. How, how late are we going? Like five, five o'clock? 
<laughs> now, <laughs> now, what time? Midnight. Midnight. Okay. What is it? Nine o'clock. We're we're done with this session. Nine oh five. Okay. Good. Oh, okay. So, all right. Then in the beginning, I'll start at the beginning, right? You know, <laughs> and we'll uh, you know, go from there. Uh, all right. Then a couple more here. Um, I'll tell you one of the biggest ones that has gained traction, unfortunately, in too many Christian college and pretty much every American college is, quote, the social justice gospel, okay? And uh, again, one of my specialty areas is dealing in law and justice and these areas. And I'll tell you, the, um, there's a whole lot to say about this one. But first of all, uh, in the end, is there anything wrong with, you know, making sure that people get justice, right? Uh, if you're a victim, uh, make sure that justice is done, you know, that, you know, uh, that your victimizer is properly uh, prosecuted. No. Uh, if someone, you know, steals your money, is there anything wrong with seeking justice that you get your money back, you get remunerative justice? No, nothing wrong with that. Is there anything wrong with truly trying to seek that everybody is treated equally? Uh, and that there are no, quote, disparaged people groups. Nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, every, all human beings are made in the image of God. We're all, you know, equally valuable by nature. And the fact is we should not treat people uh, in any horrible or worse way because they're of a different, you know, gender, different ethnicity, uh, y- you name it. I mean, the fact is, is they're all made in the image of God and should be considered uh, of value. So, But the problem is with the social justice gospel that's crept into the church and into Christian universities is that it's taking the place of, uh, unfortunately, the real gospel. See, the point is, is you'll hear these folks saying, well, Jesus came basically as the head social justice warrior. And so what does that mean? Well, now you have to equalize all outcomes everywhere. Now that, you know, uh, you have to quote, and I'll just say this, look, you know, now you have to deal with your, quote, white privilege. You have to deal with this. You have to deal with that. The problem with this is that this is not grounded in the gospel itself. It's grounded in a view called neo-Marxism, okay? Uh, Marxism originally said, okay, well, first of all, it's an atheistic worldview or, 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 or uh, approach to life. And unfortunately, what it saw is that what we, what we had to do now is basically through violent revolution and restructuring is uh, basically m- make sure that the government takes a hold of everything and we redistribute uh, things economically. Okay. And then when Marxism destroyed just about every country that it was tried in, okay, uh, the academics in, the, in, the, in basically the 60s and 70s said, you know what, yeah, this pretty much just ruins every country, but how, how do we fix it? So they changed it to neo-Marxism, and neo-Marxism now just looks at the, quote, the inequities among people of the world and say, now we have to fix that based on government power structures, and it's not necessarily economic. So this is where you talk about victim classes all the time. You have perpetual victim classes, and uh, again, you name it. But the point is here is instead of treating people as individuals, and there's the key, individuals. They treat people by groups, by groupthink. And when you think about this, is, are you going to appear before God as a, as a group or as an individual? As an individual. Fact is, is when I, I mean, I've talked to people on this. It's amazing that people say, well, you know, your race, you know, hurt my race. You know, races don't hurt anybody. People hurt people. That's number one, but somehow Jesus came to, to make sure that, again, groups are propped up, that, you know, unfortunately, there's redistribution of everything because of that instead of it done on individual merit. I, again, I could give you a whole bunch on that, and I can send some articles to uh, Dale and uh, Pastor John here if you guys want to read more on this, but this stuff is endemic in the church uh, and in Christian universities. Uh, the fights that go on, uh, I mean, it, um, you know, so... That's, that's all I'll say about this, is that the problem with social justice is it virtually doesn't talk about the gospel. It doesn't talk about, uh, again, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection to deal with the penalty of sin. It deals with simply equalizing past injustices. So I'll say this, you want to equalize past injustices, I think Egypt owes a whole lot of money to the Jews, right? So I haven't seen that offer made on the table yet, Okay. 
and uh, you know, being here in, in, in the Southland, I mean, you, you can look at every people group in the world, and that you know, I, I don't see the, uh, you know, when you take the Islamic nations that basically participate in the slave trade, you know, I just don't see the, the slavery reparations people here going to Saudi Arabia or any of the other Middle Eastern nations saying, yeah, you guys participated in the slave trade, so you know, pony up the money. How's that going to work out? Uh, or, you know, at what point are you going to go back to, quote, you know, uh, you know, First Nation people and say, who is that little tribe that owned the land in, in, in Mesoamerica before the Aztecs came along and killed them off? Are there any descendants? Are they going to give it back to them? See, if you want to do this, then, then do it completely and do it right. See, the problem is, it, it, again, there's a lot of problems with it, but uh, the problem is it doesn't deal with individual merit. It doesn't deal with, with forgiveness and reconciliation with God. It, it deals with a meritless redistribution of a victim uh, class, and somehow that's the, the modern good news in the church. And I'll tell you, that's something you need to get up to speed on. Uh, all right, a couple more, and then I'll, uh, I'll hit a few doctrinal specifics. Um, Talk about, you know, the magical mystery gospel, okay? Um, here, are, it, it's, you know, the gospel is only about fixing me personally, individually, and internally, okay? Now, it's very important that it starts that way, but the point is, is that we're saved, what, unto good works, unto fellowship, Unto being a member of the church. One of the biggest problems we have, quote, in the church today is a lot of people don't want to go to church anymore. They don't want to be a member of the body of Christ. They don't see that as being, you know what, I understand I'm different from the world. I'm part of the ecclesia, the church, the called out ones. God called me for a purpose to be different to assemble with those who are righteous, who have a common purpose. So we can get together and, and nurture each other, worship God, reach out and help others, preaching the gospel. And the problem is, nah, I don't like church. It's too boring for me, right? You stay, in, you stay as an individual Christian. So the gospel of mystical, personal individualism, right, uh, stay away from that, too, because that, that's, unfortunately, you look at, you know, Barna statistics, everything else, there are a lot of people who kind of be Christian who just rarely go to church anymore. And, uh, of course, there may be a correlation with the fact that maybe, yeah, there's, if you're not getting taught at church, you're not preaching the gospel, you're not getting built up in the faith, uh, you know, it's a, well, if you have an ineffective church, you know, then... Uh, why are people staying away? You've got to look at how effective your church is as well. And at the same time, if you don't like that church, go find one that's effective and become a member. Be a member of the body of Christ. So, all right, so that's, uh, I mean, those are a few of the movements and false gospels hitting us. But uh, So now, I, I mean, I teach a uh, class called Cults of America. So you look at the threats. Uh, there's the... I'll tell you, there's, there's the, uh, the threats of atheism and skepticism, okay? What are threats? <clears throat> the threats are that the church doesn't do its job. We don't train our people how to think, do apologetics, how to defend the faith. And then what happens? You go to, go to your first year at a, at a secular university, uh, an anti-God, anti-Christ university, and then they start teaching you atheism, they start teaching you skepticism, that you can't know things. They start teaching you postmodernism, uh, that, you know, we're so trapped by our perspectives that we can't get to, if there is capital T truth, we can't get it. This is just how our community speaks, okay? And then the people come back to their pastors and their staff who are not trained, don't know how to deal with this, don't know how to establish the Christian faith, and then instead of giving them an intellectual defense of the faith as commanded, in Scripture, they say, well, you got a faith problem, just pray about it. And then after, you know, a couple more questions back to the leaders, they say, you know what, there aren't any good reasons to believe Christianity is actually true anymore. So this is why, again, when you start thinking about it, our, our theory of knowledge in a culture is significant. So if someone's teaching you postmodernism that we can't have capital T truth and knowledge, right, here's, see, here's the problem. These people say we can't have, we don't know truth and language is inadequate to convey truth. Do you see the problem with that? It's self-refuting because they just use language to convey the truth that we can't know truth. Okay? 
And by the way, all, just like a skeptic who says we can't have knowledge, well, you just, you, you just gave me a piece of knowledge that we can't have knowledge. Hello? You know. But, re, but, but see, this kind of stuff is really pretty easily refuted because it refutes itself. Uh, that's like saying, you can, by the way, a self-refuting statement is something like this. All English sentences are less than three words long. I can't utter a word of English. Okay? Yeah. By even saying it, it refutes itself. Okay? So the point is this, but, but people get to these secular universities and then start, we don't have knowledge, we can't have knowledge, or <clears throat> all we have is our perspective. And unfortunately, what's called the emergent church movement, okay? There's always someone trying to make the church relevant to culture, okay? Which, by the way, um, you think about what liberalism is, okay? Uh, the theological movement, we call that modernism from the 18th century when, quote-unquote, enlightenment thinking uh, pervaded uh, the West, uh, particularly Europe and America, and see, now, according to, to modernist thinking, enlightenment thinking, we can't have direct knowledge of God. We can only have indirect knowledge of God. So all we can have is natural theology, right? So we can know God exists and we ought to be good. You know, there's natural law written in our hearts, and somehow we can deduce you know, co cosmological arguments for the existence of God. There's a personal, powerful being that caused the universe to come into existence a limited amount of time ago. Great. So God exists and we ought to be good. Well, what do we do with Jesus, the cross, the incarnation, the scriptures, everything else? Scrap them. We have to redefine them. Uh, the Bible, inspiration now means Paul had a really good day and kind of grunted out some good thoughts, right? Kind of like modern, uh, modern artists being inspired. Um, God's not triune. That, that's myth. Uh, you know, there's really, we're, there's no original sin. There's no corrupt nature. We're basically good people. Um, <clears throat> Christ came as a mere man to set us free from our ignorance as the greatest ethicist who ever lived and probably was the head of, you know, probably was the head of the Boy Scouts in Jerusalem and uh, everything else. And that <clears throat> taught us the great love ethic. So it could, just keeps getting better every day and in every way, right? And the atonement is, is Christ just, you know, uh, showing how loving he was by dying on the cross. That's called the moral influence theory, the atonement. You say, wait, but does it actually pay a penalty? Oh, no, no, that, that's pagan stuff. That's throwing virgins into volcanoes, the liberals say, right? Uh, but excuse me, but you say that Christ went to the cross to show how loving God is, but it doesn't actually pay a penalty. How is it loving for, for God to torture an innocent man to death for, for to do nothing except to show how loving he is, when it doesn't actually do anything except show how loving you are. You, you see, liberalism is insanity, right? So, but, so this is why, as they say, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, liberalism is the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man and the neighborhood of Gilbert, okay? You know, uh, that's it. It's getting better every day in every way. Now, of course, you know, then, you know, along came World War I, World War II, and everything else. And, you know, it ain't getting better every day in every way. So, so we get postmodernism. Where we just, well, we, get, we can't have any knowledge. It's all you know, internal. Well, think about this. You go to a postmodern church, they don't emphasize gospel. They don't emphasize preaching because you can't understand the objective contents of words and truth. So what do they do? If you've ever been to one of these, you turn the lights down, light candles, put pastels in the back, have someone paint a picture on the stage, uh, you know, have some, have some smooth jazz in the background or something, uh, and everyone goes around and takes communion, and, and you contemplate your navel for an hour, okay? Why? Because there's no preaching of the Word that Paul said to do. Why? Because we have lies are what condemned us, and we need truth to save us. That's it. Know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's it. But not according to the emergent church and the postmodern gospel. Okay? So, on all these things, we have about, what, three minutes left? Okay, I, start, I feel the trap door rattling a little bit, so we'll, uh, I will move on. But <clears throat> so when you... I, I've got my list here, I, and by the way, you can go to my website, um, I have a couple of them, theolaw.org, T-H-E-O-L-A-W.org, that's my uh, Biola page where I put all my handouts there. All my handouts are available for free on that page. Uh, I run a group called the Institute for Theology and Law, I have a bunch of stuff on that page too, it's itlnet.org. Uh, but 
this handout I'm dealing, dealing with theological char characteristics of cults and heresies and so forth. Just real quickly, I'm going to do a grocery list here. Bottom line is this, is that first, <coughs> you need essential Christian doctrine. All the false views affecting the church, first and foremost, are going to reject one or more essential Christian doctrine. And let me hit them for you real quick. The in full inspiration, authority, and inerrancy of Scripture, okay, and methodology. So start with methodology. How do we do theology? How do we study the Bible? Can we have knowledge of God? If your answer to that is no, it doesn't matter what happens after that. So this is why I talked about postmodernism and skepticism and things like that. If you don't believe that knowledge is, of God is possible and conveyable, it don't, that all the Bible study in the world is not going to help you because you don't believe it's true or knowable. Second, they have the right scriptures. All authority comes from God, okay? The Bible itself, you know, right, is, you know, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable. So you get the wrong Scripture, like add the Quran, add the Book of Mormon, add, you know, fill in the blank, you know, the Vedas of, of the Hindus, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, add, you know, A Course in Miracles, you know, New Age literature, add, add, add all these things. Now you believe that knowledge is possible, but you went to the wrong source, okay? So I started with my own kids, started discipling them, and they're, you know, literally as soon as they could talk. So we'd have, you know, how many gods are there? One. How many persons are God? Three. Very good. Doesn't that make three gods? No, Daddy, only one. These are my 18-month-old and two-year-olds, you know, so cult-proofing your kids, right? What if someone says Jesus is not God? That's egregious heresy, Daddy. That's right. Egregious. Egregious heresy. So, that's right. One God, the right God, not a generic monotheistic God, the Trinitarian God, which I'll speak on more tomorrow. So, I'll be talking about the solas of the Reformation, particularly the biggest sola, why Jesus is the only way of salvation. Okay? So, a little more on that tomorrow. Uh, the right idea of human beings. We're made in the image of God and we're valuable. You get a wrong idea of human beings that we're gods in, you know, we're prototype gods, we're something else, then you got the wrong idea of human beings, the wrong idea of sin. I'll tell you, if you got the wrong idea of the effects of sin and you don't have guilt, you don't have alienation, you don't have corruption, and you don't have spiritual and physical death, all of that, remember, determines the job description for the Messiah. If the, only thing, if the only problem with sin is now you live in your ignorance and lack of prosperity, your gospel is going to be different, okay? So now we have guilt, alienation, corruption, uh, spiritual, physical death, and no ability ourselves to, to fix it ourselves. So what do we need now? The offended party. We need Christ, who is the God-man, the offended party to bear our harm, and to not hold it against us. Why? Because the wages of sin is death, but yet God can't die as God, but he's the offended party. So what does God have to do? God has to become a man without ceasing to be God. There you go. Merry Christmas. Okay. Then, what do you have? There's nothing left to do but to actually pay for sin because God is holy and can't let sin go unpunished. We have the cross. So what's left? By grace you have been saved through faith. And not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. Free gift. And now you have on the helmet of salvation, a diaper, and a bottle of milk. What are you supposed to do for the rest of your life? Now you're positionally righteous. Now try to be really righteous. Grow in sanctification. Confront all the crud in your life. You learned your whole life to live apart from God the wrong way. Now renew your mind. Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. All this stuff is simple. The problem is when you have a, a different gospel, a different Jesus, but import, most importantly, a, a completely different idea of salvation, you're going to get completely different means to that. So I encourage you, you'll keep studying Bible, keep studying theology, and you'll be able to st spot every false gospel that's out there. Okay, I think we're done. So, all right.